risk, something which we are going to try and explore with a, a larger study commencing in June that that's, uh, we just recently heard the good news that it's being funded by the World Bank. And commercialization of fishing industry impacts on drug use culture. There is, like there is with many, many, or what I would say all the um, so-called high-risk groups in the country, there is very low condom usage, ineffective rehabilitation, and persistent myths um, are common. And drug traffickers regularly visit the jetties and are known to sell on credit. So these are some of the findings that we have uh, from early studies um, and ongoing studies that's occurring in Kuantan. I'm now going to move on to the other so-called flagship uh, research program that, that we have uh, and that we are performing in Chiria. Hopefully most of you won't recognize this because you've not been on the inside of the prison. But this is Kajang Prison. This is where um, we, I and my team from the Project Harapan go in and we get screened. Actually, they're pretty good with us because we even get our own passes now, but we still um, get screened before we enter the, the deeper uh, ends of Kajang Prison. One of the reasons why we've chosen to uh, work in, in Kajang Prison is because um, there is also generally a much higher uh, rate of HIV within the prison population, and even more so in Malaysia, where um, drug use is criminalized. This, is, this number is pretty fluid, um, but uh, when, when I got this data from the prisons department, and I have to say, I think uh, we're very, very extremely lucky to have uh, the opportunity to work with the Malaysian Prisons Department. One of them, Tuan Guna, the Deputy Director of Kajang Prison, is here today. And uh, they have really given us uh, good access and been nothing but uh, fantastic uh, to work with. Um, the, the number of prisoners, uh, the majority of, well, more than 50% or close to 50% are in there for drug-related offenses. And more often than not, are in there just for personal use, nothing to do with violence, nothing to do with crime um, uh, that would end them, end them up in, in prison. And it's usually like a turnstile. They go in, they go out, they go in, they go out. Um, and many who are now participating in our um, studies have been in prison for at least uh, five to six times. This is a typical patient. The, he was one of our early recruits, early participants into Project Harapan. A 38-year-old man was incarcerated in March. That was his 15th time of being incarcerated. Now, if that is not an exercise in futility in terms of what, what on earth we are doing, I, I, I don't know what. Um, he's, that, that time he'd been in for... Um, Usually he's in for a few months to two years, and all in all, he's been incarcerated for a period of at least seven years. He was diagnosed with HIV back in 1996 and was recently diagnosed with uh, TB in prison and was commenced on antiretroviral. He was released in September but defaulted on both, on, on follow-up and uh, went back to his heroin and alcohol addiction and unfortunately, we had the unfortunate uh, news that he passed away on 22nd of March, 2011. When he was released, um, or just prior to his release, um, my team, consisting of very, very committed young men, mostly because it's, it's safer for the men to, to, uh, to do this when they're out in, in the field following these patients up, inquired from him where did he want to, to go home to? Did he want to go home to his family or did he want to go home to, his, uh, to, to uh, a shelter home that we have been working with to shelter some of these uh, uh, prison uh, release people? And he was really looking forward to going home to his family in Klang. So Praha took him to his parents' house. And when he got there, um, the parents said, thank you very much, please come up for a cup of tea. After you've had your cup of tea, please take him to wherever you wish to take him. So that was the end of his excitement of being released uh, from prison, and we had to find him some alternative accommodation. 
so the stigma and discrimination and and I guess I can understand um, family's reaction after 15 times of being in out of prison um, and it's something that Sam who's here from Belgium is going to try and expand that in, in a research study to look at the role of family uh, in terms of uh, rehabilitation so here we are with Project Harapan, an NIH-funded um, randomized control trial of methadone therapy and behavioral intervention. The behavioral intervention study is being led by Tinkuno, also sitting uh, in the back there, doing a wonderful job. Um, and the, the idea is to for the prisoners to, to choose whether they want to go on methadone before they release, and then we will randomize them into this very specific a behavioral intervention that's been adapted from the U.S., but uh, completely adapted to Malaysian setting in terms of um, spiritual and, and also the cultural context. Thus far, we've, uh, in fact, we've had many more since uh, I prepared this slide. We've had 85 people enrolled into this study, number of released um, close to half of that, and I'm proud to say that the... Uh, for the moment, the, the uh, number of patients being followed up is, is very, very high for, for uh, this kind of study. What we learned from a, um, a pilot that we did prior to, to actually executing the, the main study was that about the only thing that matters in terms of them staying on in the study or being lost to follow up is the dose of the methadone. For those who receive less than 80 milligrams of methadone, this, as this Kepler Meyer shows you, the risk of them relapsing is very high. So for, for, for those who receive more than 100 uh, milligrams, they tend to stay on uh, into the study. And, and this has been shown in, in many other studies uh, around the world where the, the, there is reduction in recidivism um, or going back into prison if the... Um, if patients who are addicted to opiate are adequately treated with methadone. And this is a study that my friend uh, Rick Altis uh, beautifully drew up um, that in terms of what we expect a lot from our uh, prison prisoners or ex-prisoners, but more often than not, we've put them in prison for two years, we send them out to the gate and there is nothing um, out there for them. They often don't have a, um, a home to go to, as I illustrated in that story before. Because of their addiction, if they're on inadequate dose or worse, they're not on any dose at all, um, the risk for relapse is very high. Nobody wants to employ them. Well, not nobody, but a lot of people don't want to employ them. And there's family rejection uh, and so forth. So it's no wonder that they go into this... Uh, uh, sort of recurring cycle of in and out of prison. And again, if you think it's something that they deserve it, it's something that you know we as a society do not need to worry about, then I suggest that we all think again. Because one, as I've said, they go in, they go out, they go in, they go out, and um, as, uh, again, Rick has beautifully drawn here, uh, the prison is like a semi-permeable membrane, so they don't, the HIV that they're infected with is not going to stay in prison forever. The TB um, that they have is not going to just remain in prison. And I'm, I'll share with you some pretty scary uh, data of uh, TB in our local prisons, which is being led by Dr. Haider, who's also here in the, in the background, an import from Iraq, who's done, doing a wonderful job of looking at the uh, co-infection of TB and HIV at Kajang Prison. And what Haider has done is to look at um, the HIV-positive prisoners in Kajang Prison, and lo and behold, the rate of latent TB infection is 85% amongst HIV-positive prisoners. And from his literature review, this is something Malaysia Bole is the highest in the world. And even more scary for people like Tuan Guna and his colleagues is uh, that Haider repeated this study amongst prison officers. I think it was about 400 prison officers. And guess what? The rate of TB, latent TB, amongst prison officers is also 85%. 
So what we're going to do next is to repeat this study in Pankalan Chipper, where we think the ventilation is a little better, and um, uh, hopefully we won't find uh, such high rates uh, in, in, in Pankalan Chipper. So what this tells you is that, um, you know, we can't continue to ignore the problem of uh, drug use and now TB, sorry, drug use and HIV and now uh, TB and HIV. Because other people have also shown that um, this is in Central, in East, Central Asian and Eastern European countries where the, the HIV and uh, drug use epidemic is even worse um, than in Southeast Asia, that for each percentage point increase in incarceration rate, there is an associated increase in the population of TB incidence of 0.34%. So ladies and gentlemen, we can continue to ignore drug use, HIV, and TB at our peril because it's coming closer and closer to us. Now, one of the um, modern medical miracles that I've been um, lucky to witness uh, in my career as a, as a doctor is that of the advent of the highly active antiretroviral therapy. When I first trained at the... Uh, uh, Fairfield Infectious Diseases Hospital. It was filled with uh, handsome young gay men, mostly, who were infected with HIV and dying. Um, in those days, um, there was no um, antiretroviral therapy. But as this graph from the CDC shows you, the rate of death um, due to HIV has decreased tremendously since uh, the mid-1990s when highly active antiretroviral therapy uh, became available. Unfortunately, um, as I shared with you from the very beginning, uh, despite our population, we have had close to 13,000 people who've died from HIV, and that's, that's the ones that we know of. And part of the reason is because of the lack of access uh, to treatment, even though Malaysia has gone to great pains to um, uh, invoke the compulsory licensing to, in, to enable us to to uh, import generic medications in, the, uh, in 2001. And I think part, although this hasn't been uh, looked at in great detail, although Dr. Rosnida is uh, doing that study amongst, again, amongst HIV positive prisoners to understand why is it that most of them are not on treatment, I suspect um, it's uh, many, many um, reasons why we don't have, or we only have at best, I think, 25% of people who should be on antiretroviral treatment aren't antiretroviral treatment. Part of the reason is many of them are drug users, and we doctors ourselves are uh, pretty bad at discriminating uh, drug users, and in, particularly in the early days, we're very reluctant to treat um, drug users who are HIV positive for fear of uh, poor adherence. And this is another reason um, why many of our HIV-infected people are dying, or were dying, are dying. And that's because um, many were placed in prison and in treatment centers, so-called treatment centers, um, where access to treatment for both substance abuse and HIV were not available. Fortunately, things are changing, and uh, there are a number of people here from the ADK who really should be lauded for, for a substantial 180-degree change in policy in the last 12 months to um, institute a more evidence-based uh, treatment within their uh, drug rehabilitation centers, which have since gained um, international uh, recognition with them um, getting many, many visitors from around the region, hopefully will also influence other countries to do the same. Nevertheless, when we went in to uh, look at the situation in Pusat Serenti and interviewed about 100 uh, inmates in Pusat Serenti, three quarters of them already knew that they were HIV positive, with many of them being positive for more than five years. But 74% of them had not received any specific HIV care and most didn't even, uh, have never even had a CD4 done. That's a measure of their uh, immune suppression. 
So there was no access to antiretrovirals, no unlimited medical personnel, not, not for want of trying. I know that the uh, Director General of ADK is desperate to get um, medical care into Pusat Serenties and into, her, into their um, Pusat Hitmat, but um, uh, it's not such an easy thing. Um, only 9% had received HIV-specific care during incarceration, and uh, even though some had started treatment before they entered Pusat Serenity, many were forced to discontinue because there was no um, treatment available within these centers. So with that, I think um, things needed to change, and... and um, Fortunately, I think the winds are shifting both here in Malaysia and internationally. Um, yesterday or last week, um, the CND in Vienna, the Commissions for Narcotic Drugs, um, had their annual uh, meeting, and the um, reports that came up from came out from Vienna was was very promising in that for. It was very encouraging in terms of the language from the CND, which usually are very more pro-law um, enforcement rather than um, treatment. And uh, in the words of the former executive director of the UNODC, it is time to go back to the roots of drug control and put health at center stage. Certainly, after 20 years, 25 years of the HIV epidemic, there is no lack of evidence of the uh, scientific and evidence-based uh, HIV prevention programs to uh, either prevent or reduce the transmission of HIV through outreach. And through the work that um, the Malaysian AIDS Council, um, led by Datin Paduka Marina, who's in the back, and, and members of the Harm Reduction Working Group, we advocated to um, the powers that be in those days, uh, despite strong public uh, opposition, um, we managed to uh, convince the government to institute evidence-based methadone um, maintenance treatment and needles uh, and syringe program. I have to share with you that the opposition came more from the fact that we were giving four condoms in the, um, in the needle exchange kit rather than four needles and syringes. So I don't know what it says about our society. Okay, so we are now, as you heard, um, expanding the needle exchange program, uh, program to across the nation. And uh, this year we will receive, oh, as of July, we will start a um, global fund funded needle exchange program, which is uh, quite an achievement, I think, for the country and, and for MAC. Um, and also the expansion of methadone maintenance therapy, which personally I think um, should be expanded in much, much greater um, rate than, than is currently happening. Some, some uh, to share with you some good news from uh, evaluation from the Ministry of Health methadone maintenance treatment. What you can see is that after 12 months of being on methadone, uh, many of these people who were not able to hold full-time jobs before are now holding full-time jobs. Certainly that's the experience that we're seeing from our limited um, participants in the Harapan project and a substantial reduction in their HIV risk behavior. However, as I've alluded to, it's almost too little too late. Um, too little, as you can see, this is from um, Daniel Wolf's paper in the Lancet series. Uh, the, the number of people on methadone in Malaysia at the end there is minute compared to the number uh, that should be on it. And as I said, up until recently, there were more people in, who should be on methadone who were incarcerated than they were um, being treated uh, medically for their methadone and contributing back to society. So this is where we are in terms of our current response. Despite a very healthy change in policy, I think nonetheless we still stick to basically the supply reduction side of, of, controlling, of drug control, meaning uh, arrest and, and uh, put them in prison. And we don't do very well in terms of demand reduction either. Um, I don't think our children are being taught very well at school uh, in terms of uh, ways in which to, to uh, not fall into the pitfall of, of uh, drugs. 
And then that's because I think for many years we, we pres- prescribed the tough love uh, way of dealing with drug use. You know, we punish them um, uh, and we feel that that's how they're going to be uh, rehabilitated. And the dominance of law enforcement over, for many, many years over uh, health and harm reduction has, as I said, uh, led us into the, the, the problem of the twin epidemics that we're facing at the moment. And secondly, the moral and religious framework uh, that's linked to uh, prohibition uh, that's also um, pervasive in our society. And, and we still um, subscribe to the ASEAN Drug Free uh, 2015 and Malaysia Drug Free 2015, even though if you speak to anyone within um, those agencies, no one believes that we're going to ever be able to achieve that. So when we looked at, is it Islam that really uh, uh, prevents um, us from doing uh, what is uh, a a, a proven method, at least scientifically, in terms of preventing ill health? And and really, when we spoke to uh, people who are much more knowledgeable in, in Islamic laws than I am, um, what, what they said was that the injunctions of the Sharia law, I mean, the primary, primary um, uh, importance that, that Islam um, places is in the preservation and protection of the dignity of man and to steer mankind away from harm and destruction and show the way towards success in this world and the hereafter. And that, and uh, a program like the Needle Exchange Program uh, is permissible in that it, it leads to lesser harm um, in order to eliminate a greater harm, and that is the spread of HIV. So what what can we do? And and certainly um, this is, if we continue to go just the uh, criminal justice way, um, this is is what uh, can happen. And this is really um, a mathematical modeling that was um, done by a group of scientists uh, led by Stephanie Strathdee in UCSD in the U.S. Also, as also part of the Lancet series. What they looked at is in Nairobi, Kenya, where um, there's already a very, very uh, intense HIV epidemic uh, through sexual transmission occurring over there. And now they're going to be faced with um, a drug use epidemic um, that's beginning to take off in, in Kenya as well. And what they looked at in terms of mathematical model is that if they eliminate laws in Nairobi, which currently prohibits uh, opiate substitution therapy and scale up the needle exchange program and opiate substitution therapy to 80% and the coverage, uh, uh, to 80% of coverage, and that could prevent nearly one in three uh, new infections amongst amongst injecting drug users in Nairobi by 2015. And if they don't do any law changes, then um, that is uh, what you see. Similarly, um, in another mathematical modeling that was done in Odessa, if you combine opiate substitution therapy, needle exchange, and antiretroviral therapy by 60%, you could prevent 41% new HIV infections um, in Odessa. And this is something that we in Malaysia should really take note of because although we've introduced opiate substitution therapy, needle exchange, and antiretroviral therapy, we're nowhere near um, the 60% mark that could lead to substantial reduction in new HIV infections um, in the future. Not only um, expanding uh, prevention programs and treatment programs for injecting drug users make good health sense, but it also makes good economic sense, I think, um, where the average cost of methadone, and, and bear in mind that we have one of the world's most expensive methadone um, in the world, and the average cost is 16 ringgit uh, methadone per day. The average cost of antiretroviral uh, can be as little as 5 ringgit a day or can be as high as 300 ringgit or more a day. But the average cost in Kajang prison is 27 ringgit a day. So you know, if, if you prevent someone from getting infected and you get rid of that cost, it still makes more sense, I think, uh, to treat the in drug users with methadone than to put them uh, in prison. Sorry, Tanguna, I'm going to get you out of a job soon. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, this, these are, of course, really crude uh, figures. And uh, Dr. Chiwan from uh, the Social and Preventive Medicine uh, here is going to do some uh, cost-effectiveness analysis. And again, we just had the good news a few days ago from the World Bank, who's going to um, help us fund uh, that project. Someone else has done the costing, and that's Australia. Um, Australians, as you know, uh, or as you may not know, instituted a needle exchange program back in 1986. And since the year 2000, they have delivered 30 million needles and syringes across the nation at a cost of 243 million. And in their cost analysis, they estimated that they prevented more than 30. 2,000 HIV infections, close to 100,000 hepatitis C infection. And the estimated healthcare saving cost was one point, close to 1.3 billion. And what they felt was that for every dollar that was spent on a needle exchange, saved the Australian government um, another four Australian dollars. So when they did this second uh, return on investment on their needle exchange program, the uh, Australian government quietly increased the um, the budget for their harm reduction program. Even though they've had it for many, many years, uh, it still can be an unpopular um, uh, program in, in Australia and around the world. Um, as an example of the effectiveness of the needle exchange and other uh, harm reduction programs in Australia, they see less than 1% of their injecting drug users, or maybe 1% of their injecting drug user who's HIV infected, in contrast to our 22% uh, on, on average. As I shared with you, fortunately, the winds have changed, and, and one of the most significant changes, I think, in uh, the agency Entidad Akabangsaan, who's uh, who now totally embraced um, a, more, a much more holistic, evidence-based uh, uh, approach to dealing with drug use and have now opened what they call the cure and care centers uh, in Kuala Lumpur and, and are actively expanding around the country. And, and what it is, it's a voluntary-based uh, 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 concept, and uh, they are given methadone at these centers and other uh, ancillary services like counseling. And in fact, this prompted a uh, New Straits Times uh, editorial which says a significant change in policy signals a new sense of urgency and drug de dependency is a health issue and uh, called for the public to step up to decriminalize drug dependency and to address um, st stigma of addiction. However, it's a bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, although we have had significant changes in, well, not, not in written policy, but at least uh, in the different agencies that are dealing with this problem, the law remains um, very, very harsh. And uh, as you can see here, an ex-cop son to hang for ganja trafficking for 2.3 kilograms of ganja. Those of you who are not familiar with this, in terms of... Um, in terms of the dangers of ganja, is actually much, much, much less than a packet of Marlboro. So we did a quick calculation. Martin and I did a quick calculation. You could be sent to the gallows in Malaysia if you're selling 115 packets of cigarettes. Now, that would be a lot of Tesco owners, duty-free shop owners, and... Uh, 7-Eleven operators who are going to be sent to the gallows for selling more than 100 packets of cigarettes because really this is what it says, this is what it is. Um, and to me it just purely doesn't make sense. But then again, I'm a mere doctor. Um, what we can learn is from other countries that have taken the brave step of having a much more balanced uh, drug policy. And certainly I'm, I'm thankful for His Excellency Mr. Paul Beckers, uh, the ambassador from the Netherlands who's here today, whose country has been exemplary in terms of uh, dealing with, uh, with the problem of drug use in, in that country. But in, in Portugal, where they were facing severe uh, drug use problems not that long ago, uh, the government... Um, uh, introduce a much more uh, balanced 
drug policy and, and where they uh, essentially decriminalize personal use of drugs. And what most governments and what most publics fear is that when you decriminalize drugs, you're going to get more people using drugs. Well, actually, what they have done after 10 years of evaluation of, of this new drug policy